feel the anointing of the Holy Spirit right here, right now. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Very quickly, I want to remind you of what we taught last week. That our uncertainties versing his certainties melts in comparison to his ability. God is a powerful God. The, the Lord would say, surely, surely, I say unto you. Verily, verily, I say unto you truthfully. He doesn't lie. We talked about the power and the impact of the now moment, of how we can be standing there and see God come through or see God provide or see God miraculously do something for us and all of us have met, witnessed some type of, of miracle before. And then when we're in that moment, the awe, the faith, the motivation, the courage that you can feel that, that, that bubbles up on the inside of you, that rises up on the inside of you. But how quickly, how quickly can that now moment be swallowed up in a current crisis? Everything that you learned, everything that you felt, everything that you know that God can do, swallowed up in the current crisis. And all of a sudden, it begins to produce doubt. It begins to produce a confusion even a cancellation of what you had just been deposited from God. The current struggle has, has captured your heart, your mind, your, your emotions. You, you, you feel being stirred within you, fear. Your, your faith has been kidnapped, even nullified. There's this total absorbing of, of the moment that currently is. And unless you really stay focused and dig deep. Somehow the lessons that we learn from previous trials and circumstances and seasons, provisions and miracles of God that had happened even hours before for the case of these disciples as we read just last week were long gone in the storm. The uncertainty of the struggle has, has now shackled them we also learned that divine disposition does not rule out human action. Just because God can save doesn't mean that God doesn't want to be asked or invited or, or, or welcomed into your life, into your situation. And we learned that we don't have to just sit back and, and wait for God to save us, maybe one day, hope so, that we can cry out to God like the psalmist did when he was in the horrible pit. He cried out to God and God heard his cry and came and delivered him. But you've also got to recognize and realize the important lesson that Jesus came to them walking on the waves and would have passed them by. It was that cry from that boat for help that caused Jesus to turn toward them. I tell you, the Lord has, has got this. But sometimes we can't really give ownership over it to, to, to God because we feel like we got this. We feel like that we own this. This is my care, in my care. This is in my hands. This is within my ability until, until something tragic happens in your life, until you get the diagnosis, until you realize the symptoms are there. We, we must develop a constant awareness of our need and our dependency upon him. We never know what, what the next moment will bring, but here's the great thing, that as children of God, we might not know what the next moment brings, but we can know our God. And we can rest assured that God holds tomorrow already in his hands. Last week we found in, in Matthew, excuse me, in Mark chapter six, the disciples experiencing a storm. We also learned that this wasn't their first time being in a storm and being in a storm with Jesus. They, they were having a, a now moment that had overshadowed the previous time and the previous lesson that they had received. But with this now moment also comes an again moment. That's what I'm talking about. That's the whole essence of the lesson today, and again moment. 
I, I, I took you back to the first storm last week very briefly, and you go from Mark chapter 6 to Mark chapter 4, and you find that first storm. You find the disciples, you find them in a boat, you find them full of doubt, full of fear, full of uncertainty. You find them questioning the care of Jesus. Do you not even care that we're about to die? They're struggling with the identity of Jesus because they ask the question even after the fact of the miracle, who is this man? The, the marvel that creation, the marvel that the circumstance hears his voice and obeys his voice and, and steals it with his calming voice, with his command and a great peace comes not only upon the disciples, but comes upon the storms and the sea. Before the storm in Mark chapter six, we also learn that Jesus and his disciples are on a hillside. Multiplied thousands are there. We learned that 5,000 men were there plus their families. Multiplied thousands were there and they needed to be fed. And with two fish and with five loaves of bread, we, we find that not only does he meet the need of the multiplied thousands, but after the fact, the disciple stands there with 12 baskets of revelation, more revelation, more revelation of that, that, that our God can provide more revelation of his supernatural identity. It's after this we find an again moment. It happens. He, he uses the circumstances of life to teach us and how often do we get them and how often do we need them and how often do we miss the life lesson. It, it is as if we, we, we learn for the very first time over and over every situation that comes somehow in the middle of, of the tragedy, in the loss, in the sickness, in the problem, we lose all sight of what God has already proven himself to be. And somehow or another, the problem overshadows the promise and we begin to panic and hysteria sets in and we so many times make mistakes. And when we look back, to that moment, when we look back at the moment that we just come out of, it's then that we begin to see, oh yeah, that's right, God, God, you did it again. But in the current crisis, sometimes the clouds hides the beautiful starry skies, and sometimes even the sun that shines down in the middle of the day. As in Mark chapter four here, now in Mark chapter six, they're on a boat, they're in the water, there's storms again. There's more struggle, there's more terror, there's, there's fear that is crippling the disciples. There's this cancellation again of what little faith that they had. And then again, and again, here comes Jesus. This time he's walking on the waves. We learned last week that this time when he steps into the boat, he doesn't go to the bow of the boat and speak uh, to the storm. He just steps into the boat and immediately coming on, on, into the boat, the storm stilled. Again, the disciples are absolutely amazed. But then we listen to verse 52. After this beautiful thing begins to take place again in their life, he's given them another again moment for them to, to grasp, for them to get a hold of the lesson that, that I'm in control, that I'm God, that I love you, that I do care for you that you can call on me, that I, that I can save, that I can deliver. And we find this, this sad verse tucked up in the middle of this beautiful miracle. And in verse 52 of Mark chapter six, it just simply says, for, for they still didn't understand the significance of the miracle of the loaves and their hearts were too hard to take it all in. He is doing with them an again moment. He's using what great teachers use even today, and that is repetition. Say this with me. Do this again. Write it down three times. Write it down 10 times. Repetition. He's using an again moment, and they're still struggling with learning the lesson that God's got this. In Mark chapter six, verse 53, we find that after the storm, they cross the lake, they bring the boat uh, on the shore. 
Verse number 54, the Bible says that they climb out of the boat and the people, now this is an amazing thing, the, the disciples are struggling with the identity of God, struggling with who he is, but the people that were not even in the storm, the people that were on the mainland had no problems recognizing Jesus at once. The Bible says in verse number 55 that they ran throughout the whole area, that, that they were carrying sick people on mats to wherever they heard that he was. Verse 56 says this, wherever he went, whether it was in the villages or the cities or the countrysides, that they brought the sick out to the marketplaces and they begged him to let the sick touch at least at least the fringe of his robe. And the Bible says that all who touched him were made whole, were healed. That then it doesn't stop. There, there's this flow. You, you turn the page over and you find Mark chapter seven. And we see that there is this girl that is possessed by demons and her, 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 her mother is stressed out. Emotionally, it's, it's terrorizing her. And she has this uh, uh, conversation with Jesus and finally Jesus is moved by her great faith. He doesn't touch the girl. He doesn't sin for the girl. The Bible says that he speaks the word. The girl wasn't present but speaks, sends his word out and it was there in that same hour that he spoke that the girl was free from demonic possession and there was great rejoicing in that family. We find that next that, that we, we, we see him uh, coming up to a, a, a deaf man. And, and the man is not only deaf, but he is, he is mute. The, the Bible tells us that he touches this man, he touches his ears, and, and, and it was then that his ears popped and he was able to hear, but here's something that's kind of gross, it's nasty. But nevertheless, uh, the Bible says that Jesus spit. He spit, now, now whether he spit on his fingers, whether he spit into the man's uh, mouth, I don't know. All I know is that he spit and the Bible said that he touched. He spit and he touched the man's tongue. And the Bible says that that man was not only healed from his deafness, but this man was able now to talk. He was able to use his tongue. He was able to communicate. In Mark chapter seven, he, he frees this girl. In Mark chapter seven, he heals this man that is deaf and mute. And right there tucked up in all of, it, all, all of this, we see verse 37 of Mark chapter seven. And man, I love this. They were completely amazed. Everybody that was standing around, even his disciples. Now watch this. The Bible said that once again, they were completely amazed. Amazed every time a storm comes by and he steals it. Amazed that every time he's able to cast out a devil. Amazed every time that he's able to raise the dead. Amazed how at, at every time he can touch a man's ears and they open, talk to mute people and they talk back. Man, completely amazed. God wants to amaze us again in the church. Don't underestimate God. They were completely amazed and they said, Again and again. <laughs> I love that. Again and again. From moment to moment, from now moment to next now moment, from season to season, from day to day, from hour to hour, from minute to minute, from second to second, again and again. Completely amazed. Everything he does, he does it wonderful. Man. He even makes the deaf to hear. Gives speech to those that cannot speak. And if he did it then, he can do it for you today. Now stay with me because we're about to learn the lesson. In Mark chapter 8 begins with another again moment. These guys are still, even though they're amazed again and again, God's doing wonderful things. These guys can't seem to get it. They still seem to be totally oblivious. This time, it's not 5,000 men plus their families, but the Bible tells us here in Mark chapter 8 that he feeds 4,000. And this time, he does it with seven loaves of bread. And the Bible didn't even give us the number. It just says a few little fish. A picture of maybe a can of sardines or something. I don't know. 
But when it was over with, seven baskets more of another again moment revelation. Man, he comes through again in that moment. How many times does it take for these guys to learn the lesson that you don't have to doubt God, but you can trust him? We, we find them leaving this hillside leaving the thousands behind fed and fulfilled. And we find the disciples in verse number 14. They're in a boat again, but this time there's not a storm from without. This time the storm is from within. They're arguing over food. Of all things, he's just fed 4,000. He's just fed 5,000 plus families with a few loaves and a few fish, and here these guys, haven't, they haven't learned the lesson yet. The Bible says in verse number 14, the disciples had forgotten to bring any food. And they had only had one loaf of bread with them in the boat. Skipping down to verse number 17, Jesus knew what they were saying. So he said, why is it? Why is it that you are arguing about bread? Don't you know and don't you even understand yet? Yet? How many times have I tried to teach this to you? Are your hearts too hard to take it in? Sometimes we miss it, don't we? And this is what he says. He says, you have eyes, but you can't see. You have ears, but you can't hear. Don't you remember anything at all that I continue to teach you in these again moments. And he takes them back. He takes them back and he says, you know, you, do you remember when I fed the 5,000 with five loaves of bread? How many baskets were left over for you to hang on to, to look down and see that I'm a provider? And they all said it right, 12. Then he says, well, what, about, what about when I just fed the 4,000? What, what, what about... Then, and, and they said, you know what? We, we had seven, seven loaves to feed them with, a few little fish, but we ended up with seven large baskets. I like that with the emphasis, large, not just seven baskets, but seven large baskets of leftovers. Didn't you pick it up? Yeah, yeah, we picked up seven. And then he said it again. He emphasizes it again. Don't you understand yet? He asked them, don't you understand yet sometimes I'm just going to go ahead and include myself. I'm not going to even talk about you. I'm going to talk about me. Sometimes I'm a poor student. Sometimes I just don't get it. But I want you to listen very closely. It all relates. Nothing happens by accident. God knows what we need. And so here's the Lord relating us back to their, their seeing and their hearing. And the Lord says, wait just a minute. I'm going to give them yet another sermon. I'm going to give them another lesson, but this time he uses an illustrated sermon. In Mark chapter 8, verse number 22, this is what happens. Jesus comes into Bethsaida. Some people brought a blind man to Jesus. Verse 23, the Bible said that Jesus took this blind man by the hand, led him out of the village how many knows that sometimes we've got to be taken out of our current surroundings, which becomes an imprisonment, amen? Then spitting on the man's eyes, here he is spitting again. The Bible said that he laid his hands on him and he asked, watch this, he asked the man, can you see anything now? Verse 24, the man looked around. Yes, he said, I can see people, but I can't see them very clearly. Now here's the thing. This man could have done what many of us do. We get just enough God to get satisfied and we try to live off of that little bit that we've experienced with God the rest of our life and we never ever realize that God's got new mercy every day and a grace that is absolutely overwhelming every day of our life and so many blessings and so much goodness that God wants to bring to our life. And somehow or another we try to hoard the little bit that we've got God, and we try to ration it out. And that's the reason why we've got Christians that are in panic mode. That's the reason we, why we got Christians that are in doubt mode. Because what they have has been on the shelf for many, many years and they don't have a fresh touch from God. 
And this man could have just said, you know what? I just got touched by the Messiah. I don't need another touch. Matter of fact, what he's just done has made me better. Because he could have left and said, the Messiah touched me. Jesus, Jesus touched me. The miracle worker touched me. And I'm now better. Because I went from blindness to blurry vision. Now, see, here's the thing. I, I, I'm smart enough to know that if a man can't see anything and he gets touched and he begins to see something, in, even if it's in a blurred fashion, yes, he's better. He says, I, I'm, I'm looking around and I'm seeing, I'm seeing men, but they look like trees walking around. Here's the thing that you need to learn. That God didn't touch him to make him better. And God didn't touch you to make you better. And God doesn't want to touch this situation that you're going through so that you can get better. His intentions was not to make this blind man better nor make us better. His intentions is to make us whole. To make us whole. And I sense the anointing of the Holy Ghost here right now. That's what somebody needs to hear, that God's come today to make you whole. The Bible tells us that it was then that Jesus done something unorthodox. The Bible said that he touched him again. He touched the man again. He had another again moment. The first time made him better. The second time made him whole. Because in verse 25, Jesus placed his hands on the man's eyes again and his eyes were open, his sight was completely restored, and he could see things clearly. Sometimes we need an again moment. And it's here that we learn from the illustrated sermon that we sometimes need to be touched by God again. No matter how powerful the first time might have been. That's what this day is about. I believe it with all of my heart. I believe that this is what this season is about for the church. For us to be positioned in a way that we become receptive to another touch of God in our life. For us to be made aware, kingly aware, to see clearly that we need God more than ever. In Ecclesiastes 7, verse number 3 it talk, starts talking about your name and chosen riches and it talks about going to funerals instead of festivals and it talks about uh, contemplating your, your death and dying and eternity and where you're going to spend eternity. Be right in the middle of it. The wisdom comes off the page and slaps us in the face and it says, sorrow is better than laughter. For sadness has a refining influence on us. I've never seen such terror. I've never seen such pandemonium. I've never seen such sadness. But if we allow it, we can recognize that God is doing something. Early this morning, I was on Fox News on, on, on the app, and I was kind of reading over some of the things that was going on and somehow or another, I come across this reading, and it says, Dolly Parton says, God is going to use this epidemic. <laughs> if Dolly Parton can tell us God's in this, shouldn't the rest of us see it too? God's in this. God's not the author of bad things, but he can use the bad things of life. So often the tragedies of life, the loss of life, or the losses in life, the moments just like these that we're in will bring a temporary sanity. It will slow us down to produce a screen for us to see God projecting revelation. Much like that first touch that that blind man received. It was great. He went from blindness to blurry, but God's not finished. Is it it's, 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 it's easy to become like that man in the book of James who, who saw the reflection, but he left not doing anything about it and ultimately forgot what he saw. 
Touch us again, God. Touch us again. So I end today by saying, go with me to Acts chapter 2 to a young church that is being born in power. The power of the Holy Spirit is felt as God touches the 120 and they come out of that upper room and they are ministering and making a difference and the thousands are being saved. Notice in Acts chapter 3, they go from being touched powerfully to now they are using what they received from that touch. They're ministering to a man laying by a gate in the situation that he was in. And before long, that man who never stood is standing on his feet and he's shouting and dancing and praising God and a sermon is preached on the platform of that man's praise, on the platform of that man's miracle. Thousands, thousands. It says 5,000 men. We don't know how many got saved. Thousands get saved. But then the threatenings, the uncertainties, the aggravations, the frustrations of life begins to come their way. And they were reprimanded for using the name Jesus. And in Acts chapter 4, the Bible said that they gathered together and they didn't come and complain about it or share the bad news. They just simply came together and they lifted up their voice to God with one accord. And then in verse number 29, this is how it reads. And now the Lord, now Lord, behold their threatenings and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness that we might speak your word by the stretching forth of your hand to heal. And God, in the time that we live, let there be signs and let there be wonders be done in the name of thy holy child, Jesus. And when they had prayed, my God, have mercy. The place was shaken where they were assembled together and there they were all filled. Watch this, I love this. They were filled again. Those that had already received are receiving again a fresh touch of the Holy Ghost, a fresh touch of God. The Bible said that they began to speak the word of God with boldness. Ephesians 5, 17, 18. Don't be unwise. Understand what the will of God is. Verse number 18 says, don't be drunk with wine. Where is excess? But be filled. And that word in the original means to be filled again and again and again. To be touched by God and to be touched by God again and again with the Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit. So I challenge you today. So I was trying to figure out how, how am I going to flow out of this? Isaiah 43 comes to my mind. He, he says, you've got eyes, but you can't see. You've got ears, but you can't hear. He brings us to these again moments, again and again and again and again. And here we are in another crisis. Here we are in another situation. Are we going to doubt? Are we going to panic like everybody else? Are we going to mourn like everybody else? Are we going to live like everybody else? No, no, no. No, I'm telling you that our God is a living God. I'm telling you that our God sits upon the throne. And I'm telling you that he's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. And if God can do the things that I preach about in the word, God can do them today. Today, let that God flood your thoughts, flood your heart, flood your situations and your surroundings right now. Be touched by the Holy Spirit again. Be touched, woman of God. Be touched, man of God. Be touched, son and daughter. Be touched today. And I challenge you, whatever you do, this is what Isaiah 43, 18 says, but forget all of that. This is nothing compared to what I'm going to do. God... It's getting ready for another round of glory. For I am going to do a brand new thing. See? See it? It's already begun. Don't you see it? I will make a road through the wilderness of the world for my people to go home and create rivers for them in the desert. That's what God will do for you.